While all these players are probably responsible for some fantasy football losses this week, I'm not panicking about all of them. Some of them I actually think are going to bounce back going into the future. Now, of course, others I am very concerned with, but we're going to be ranking these players from least concerned to most concerned rest of the season. Starting off with James Cook. Yes, on Sunday night, it was a very bad performance. You only got 5.8 fantasy points. And yes, Ty Johnson did steal a rushing touchdown from James Cook. But if you were worried about James Cook having his rushing touchdowns vultured at the goal line, you have no business drafting James Cook. We understand that Cook is not going to see anywhere close to 100% of the red zone opportunities. And you are also going to have the Josh Allen vultured rushing touchdowns as well. This was already priced in for James Cook. With Cook, he's still a running back that can be seeing anywhere from 10 to 20 opportunities per game and what should be one of the best offenses in the NFL. That has not changed. It has not changed that, yes, he's going to get vultured the goal line with touchdowns. Yes, maybe we got a little lucky to have four touchdowns through the first three weeks. That was never going to keep up. I have James Cook ranked as RB11 in our rest of season rankings and probably not going to be moving him from there. Now, going over to a quarterback that I had ranked as the QB2 overall this week, only behind Josh Allen, could not have been more excited about him. Um, Kyler Murray was really disappointing in what was supposed to be a phenomenal matchup. Washington had had the worst defense up until this point. Sportsbooks were projecting out the Arizona Cardinals to score the most points in the NFL. And you look at what Kyler Murray did, where you only have a total of 9.98 fantasy points. It was extremely disappointing. Now, a couple different things to the context of this. You had no Trey McBride in this offense. If you look at McBride's involvement, based off the target share that he has and the back uh, fill-in that they have at tight ends, or I mean the tight end that comes in to play that Trey McBride role, has a total of zero targets for zero receptions and zero receiving yards. So I think when you get McBride back in, the top weapon in this offense outside of Marvin Harrison Jr. And we see a little more Kyler Murray rushing where you go through the first three weeks here. Kyler Murray was averaging over 50 rushing yards per game. You should be in line for a big Kyler Murray bounce back. Now this next week against the Niners is probably going to be pretty tough, but based off the rushing upside in a four point passing touchdown league, he is still ranked my quarterback five rest of season. Now going over to what we have with Brock Bowers. Brock Bowers was supposed to save the tight end position. Now, obviously, we'll talk Kyle Pitts at the end. We'll talk Mark Andrews at the end because those are the most concerning guys. Here, Brock Bowers, I'm not super concerned. I will admit, I had him as my tight end one overall this week. I thought he was set up to absolutely crush with no Devontae Adams. And with Brock Bowers, he sees fewer receiving yards than the backup tight end here in Harrison Bryant. It was disgusting. You only have three targets. And this is actually a decline now over the past three weeks where we go back to week three against Carolina. Week three against Carolina was really ugly where he only had four targets in this offense. Going into the future, however, with Bowers, it's still a rookie tight end that so far this season is sitting here with over 20 targets through the first four games. He's averaging about five and a half, six targets per contest. That's a tight end that I'm fine ranking as a top five option rest of season, especially with the Devontae Adams injury in the potential Devontae Adams trade rumors that you have in Las Vegas. Now, going over to what we have with Travis Etienne, Etienne, I was panicking with halfway through the game. I mean, in the first quarter, Etienne was standing on the sideline. The announcers didn't know what was going on. They were saying, oh my gosh, look at Travis Etienne. He's not at the game ball. They were making it sound like Travis Etienne got benched because we didn't know the extent of him dealing with the shoulder injury. Sounds like Etienne um, is not getting benched here. Sounds like Etienne is still going to be the starting running back going into the future for Jacksonville. I mean, the role was very consistent for what you've had now through the first four weeks. Every single game with Etienne, you've had double-digit touches. Every single game with Etienne, you've had some involvement as a receiver. And we only have two touchdowns through the first four games because this has been one of the worst offenses in the NFL. And this should be a very bad team going into the future as well. But with the panic meter on Travis Etienne, we're not so much panicked about potentially the loss of a job. It's more so just about the Jacksonville Jaguars offense. But because the guaranteed volume's there, I have them ranked at RB18 in our rest of season rankings over there on flockfantasy.com. Now, of course, you can always go pull up all the expert rankings for free on flockfantasy.com. If you want to add mine, just hit add creator Mason Dodd and you can see them there. I, I'm debating between ETN or Jordan Mason in our rest of season ranks, but I think Mason obviously has the risk of McCaffrey coming back in a few weeks where we had the report from Rappaport coming out saying that McCaffrey is going to be back at latest by early November, but that's for a different video. Now going over to Brandon Ayuk. Brandon Ayuk is one of the many L's that we have to take. Y'all know I take L's every single week. 
Um, I sat here and early in the week, I thought you were going to have no Debo Samuel. I thought you were going to have no George Kittle. We ranked Brandon Ayuk as a top 10 option at the wide receiver position. Now Debo is in, Kittle is in, the target volume is way down. You fall from 10 targets two weeks ago against the Rams down to five targets this past week. And now so far this season, you have five targets, five targets, 10 targets, five targets. When Debo Samuel plays, when George Kittle plays, Brandon Ayuk has not seen a ton of volume. It's a team that obviously is going out there wanting to run the ball as much as they can. In these games where they blow out teams like the New England Patriots, they're able to do just that. We have 32 total rush attempts, only 27 pass attempts in this offense. Now, with that being said, if you look at my rest of season ranks for Brandon Ayuk, I currently do have him at wide receiver 21. I have him right in the same range as Stefan Diggs, Deontay Johnson, Devontae Adams, and DJ Moore. So to be honest with you, I still think that he is definitely a consideration there at wide receiver two. We're just a lot less excited about him than we were before the season. And also a player that we are a lot less excited for now than we were before the season. Mid wide receiver two, Tyree kills underdog picks like 49 and a half receiving yards right now for tonight. Going to be super interesting to watch out for. But if you're new to underdog fantasy, you can actually get that Tyree kill pick moved down to more than less than half a total yard. If you sign up to underdog with code flock, you can find the link in the description and comment section. Promo code flock is going to get you that 50% deposit bonus up to $1,000. Plus on top of that, you will be getting that free Tyree kill pick. And you're going to get a free team review through flockfantasy.com in the live streams that we are hosting every night. Just go through the link in the description or comment section and use code flock. Now, something else I had to take my L on. We had a lot of people coming out last week saying, Mason, you're ranking Bijan Robinson way too high. Mason, Bijan Robinson is no longer a locked and loaded tier one player. And to be honest with you, I heard y'all and I rolled my eyes a bit and I went, okay, these fools have no idea what they're talking about. I mean, Bijan Robinson is averaging 20 opportunities a game through the first three weeks. It's been in tough matchups overall. Bijan Robinson still a locked and loaded top five running back easily in, well, obviously this week was a disaster. This week, if you were looking at the split that you have with Algier versus Bijan, um, Tyler Algier sees eight carries in comparison to Bijan Robinson at seven. Algier sees 60 rushing yards in comparison to Bijan Robinson at 28. Tyler Algier plays 21 snaps in comparison to Bijan Robinson at 36. So Bijan was not utilized as that true three down running back that we would hope he would be if we were ranking him as a top five option every single week. Regardless, if you don't have the bell cow workload where we're not guaranteed 20 opportunities game for Bijan. It's a no-brainer that he has to fall in our rest of season ranks. Like, I, I I can't sit here and say, hook him horns. We love our guy. No, it, he is a faller. The question is, how far does he fall? I think what saves him and gives him a little bit of a floor here is the receiving involvement, where this past week, you get the four receptions for the 46 receiving yards. I mean, just looking at what you've had so far this season, you are sitting with a total of 15 receptions through the first four weeks. We're sitting with a total of about 130, 140 receiving yards as well. That is going to give him a baseline level floor. He has scored double digit points every single week. And I think the touchdown should come in better matchups in the future. So I want to be on record. Bijan Robinson needs to fall. I began to tweak this in the rest of season ranks on flockfantasy.com where I moved him behind Justin Jefferson. I moved him behind Jamar Chase. He probably needs to continue to fall further than this. And please let me know what you think in the comments. Let me know what you also think about Brees Hall because Brees Hall has a much worse week here. Brees Hall, 3.8 fantasy points. Going up against the Denver Broncos team where the Broncos can't score. So you'd assume, oh, okay, yeah, the Jets are going to be able to run the ball. That's what they're going to lean on. But uh, well, the Jets can't score either. So it doesn't freaking matter. The Braylon Allen usage is actually a real concern that you have for Hall. It's another week where Braylon Allen looks very good. He has eight carries compared to send to Brees Hall at 10. Braylon Allen's also more efficient with those carries as well. Um, Braylon Allen does grab a reception for 12 receiving yards out of the backfield. Like this is slowly kind of turning into a split backfield. Obviously, Brees Hall is the main guy. Like, like I said, coming into the week, the only way you could ever consider starting Braylon Allen is if you are extremely desperate and you need to flex. Brees Hall is still a must-start player. Brees Hall is still going to have the majority of this backfield. It's just not like he's going to see 80, 90% of the snaps as you would have potentially thought coming into the year. 
What's going to save Brees, very similar to what's saving Bijan right now, is the involvement as a receiver. Where Brees Hall is right now sitting here with a total of 18 receptions through the first four weeks. And I know this doesn't sound like a big deal, but when you're getting those 18 receptions and when you're sitting with like 130 receiving yards through four weeks, it just raises your floor so much in a full PPR format that similar to Bijan, I definitely move Brees behind the elite receivers like Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase. I, I would love your opinion on how much further we should move him down, but in a full PPR format, non-PPR, it's different. Non-PPR, obviously Henry's over these guys. Full PBR format, I still kind of like them RB2 and RB3, but definitely in comparison to elite receivers, they have to fall. Now, going over to a little trio of players, let's talk about DJ Moore, Keenan Allen, and Roma Dunze. So my thought process with Keenan Allen coming back in is, okay, Rome's a borderline flex play, cannot trust him as a must-start guy. DJ Moore is still a must-start guy regardless, and Keenan Allen can't start him until we actually see him produce. I thought the issue we were going to have in this offense was there were too many mouths to feed. And instead of there being too many mouths to feed, there's just not enough food for anybody to eat. I mean, here you have 157 passing yards for Caleb Williams. One passing touchdown. We knew the passing volume was going to come down dramatically from where last week he had over 500 pass attempts. But for him to only have 23 pass attempts in this game, obviously it's a game where they are able to win. The Rams have a very difficult time moving the ball down the field. But it's still extremely concerning. DeAndre Swift has half the receiving volume here for Caleb Williams. DJ Moore saves his day just based off the receiving touchdown. But DJ Moore has 22 receiving yards. Keenan Allen has 19. And Roma Dunze has 10. So where I stand with these receivers after this game is I don't think Roma Dunze is a flex consideration play at the moment. I think Roma Dunze is an option that you have on your bench because you think he's an extremely talented player and maybe Rome is a rookie and Caleb is a rookie both continue to get better as the season goes on. Keenan Allen, I'm viewing as somebody that you have on your bench because we've seen the elite talent in the past. You're hoping that it comes back, but in reality, it's not close to being a guarantee, especially in this offense. And DJ Moore moves down for being that, I mean, mid wide receiver too, that was a locked and loaded guy every single week. To now I move DJ Moore down about wide receiver 23 as that low end wide receiver two that in a loaded team, maybe in a 10 team format, you could possibly consider benching him. Now, of course, my team's so garbage. I would never bench DJ Moore. DJ Moore got sent to my team. I'd be praising the heavens that I had someone to start. But anyway, with that being said, I think you have to lower expectations across the board with the Chicago Bears. There are a lot of players here and there's not much volume. Now, going over to somebody I sadly had to move down our ranks. I had to move Patrick Mahomes down. Looking at Mahomes, you have no Rasheed Rice due to Patrick Mahomes himself. It's, it's your own fault. Um, you have zero games this season with over 300 passing yards. You're sitting here with a total of six touchdowns for the first four weeks. We know Mahomes is a quarterback that can run the ball. Like in a close contest and a game that's a very important one to win, you're going to see Mahomes pick up 30, 40 rushing yards. Uh, you can see this with one, all the playoffs games Patrick Mahomes plays, two, with the game against Cincinnati back in week two where he had 29 rushing yards. But typically in these games that are kind of just the meaningless, the week five, week eight, week 10 regular season games, Patrick Mahomes isn't going to run. So all of a sudden we're looking at a low volume passing offense. That's lost two of its top receivers with a quarterback that's not going to run the tall ball a ton. They're just going to play good defense, limit turnovers, win football games that way with the most talented quarterback in the NFL. You have to move Patrick Mahomes down. Like Mahomes right now is sitting with an average of about 15 fantasy points per game. I have moved Mahomes behind, obviously, Jaden Daniels. Jaden Daniels, the quarterback for my rest of season ranks. Moved him behind Kyler because Kyler's at least going to give us the rushing upside. I moved him behind C.J. Stroud because with C.J. Stroud, we're for sure going to be having more passing volume. And I'm considering moving Mahomes. I mean, right now he's between Stroud and Burrow. I think that there's a chance that with the Bengals actually firing on all cylinders at the moment, at least on the offensive side of the ball, you could make an argument for Burrow over Mahomes as well. Now, speaking of the Flock League, where of course I'll trash my team, but I will flex. We are 3-1. and one. Ramondre Stevenson has been no help over the past two weeks. 
Ramadre Stevenson over the past two weeks has given my running back two slot a total of 8.5 points, averaging about four points per week. Obviously, the first two weeks were great. But looking at Ramadre, the concern is the first two weeks, the Patriots win a game and they go to overtime. As it stands right now, it looks like there's nothing close to that with New England in terms of how you can project this offense going into the future. On top of this, we're looking at Antonio Gibson having a receiving role and almost more concerning than anything is I'm sitting here going, okay, well, yeah, Ramadre Stevenson, all the volume in a horrible offense, the worst offense in the league. But he's had four fumbles in four games. Now he's only lost two of them, but with four fumbles through four games, At what point does this New England Patriots coaching staff look at the man and go, yeah, I'm sorry. We can't give you 70% of the snaps. We can't give you 20 carries in a game. If Belichick was here, I'm pretty sure Ramadre, four fumbles in four games, would not see the field at least least for some time. So that's going to be something to monitor. We know it's a horrible offense. Gibson is now getting a little bit involved as a receiver where Antonio Gibson does have the four targets, leads the team in receiving with 67 receiving yards. Ramadre in my rest of season rankings, on a team like mine, where I'm dying for any running backs I can get my hands on, I have Ramadre Stevenson probably in my starting lineup. I have him at RB26. But if you're in like a 10-team league where you have some pretty solid running backs, Ramadre Stevenson at this point is nothing more than a player you have on your bench and in a bye week where with an injury, you could potentially go through and jam him in. Now, let's go over and let's look at Kyle Pitts. Kyle Pitts is crashing, just like the entire tight end position. You have three targets for zero receptions, zero receiving yards. Kyle Pitts, so far this year, has had eight receptions through four weeks. Kyle Pitts is averaging two receptions per game. He is averaging about 25 receiving yards per game. If it wasn't for one big catch against the Chiefs and one touchdown against the Steelers, Kyle Pitts would even look dramatically worse. Head coach Raheem Morris coming out saying, we don't care about stats. We're just trying to win football. Thanks. Thanks. Um, With Pitts, the thing is, when we go through and set our rest of season rankings, it's hard to move him down to like an unstartable range because obviously you have the guys like Mark Andrews we'll need to talk about. I'm probably going to be moving him down to about tight end nine in my rest of season rankings, right behind Laporta, Ferguson, Dallas Goddard. I think I still probably prefer Kyle Pitts over David and Joku, but Pitts is slowly but surely sliding down to a range where he is about to just be a borderline waiver wire tight ends. Now let's move this over to what we have with the Ravens tight ends. Actually, before the Ravens tight ends, I'll speak on Zay Flowers just briefly. Funny enough, after the first two weeks, when we made our rankings in week three, we were getting clowned on for having Zay Flowers too low. Flowers over the past two weeks, 7.3 total fantasy points. We have a really good idea now in back-to-back games where the Baltimore Ravens are able to go out there and they're able to lead early and control the game and play the style of football they want, that there is not going to be passing volume in this offense. Lamar Jackson will see fewer than 20 pass attempts. Lamar Jackson may see 15 or fewer completions. And in that environment, no receiver, no tight, nobody's going to be interesting in fantasy. Now, obviously, in a game where it's close and a game that you are going to have to have Lamar throw the ball a ton, there, Zay Flowers is the wide receiver one. Zay Flowers, 10 targets week one, 11 targets week two. It just comes down to what you're expecting in terms of what style offense you're going to be getting for the Ravens in any particular game. Like going up against the Cincinnati Bengals, I'd say, oh, this is probably going to be a high scoring game. You would probably have a decent amount of pass attempts for Lamar Jackson. But I would have thought the same thing against the Bills. And here you get one reception for 10 receiving yards for Zay Flowers. Now going over to the tight end position. I am sorry. The most popular question that we had in the live stream this week was, do I start Mark Andrews 
or the tight end I just picked up off the waiver wire in Cole Komet. I sat here going, oh, the passing volume is going to go down in Chicago. You have Keenan Allen in. I, I, I think Cole Komet's going to let people down. I'd go Andrews. Of course, the live chat is and will always be smarter than I am. So the live chat was all screaming, Komet, 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 every time I asked them. And maybe I was too focused in on why Komet was going to be worse and not focused enough on exactly how bad Mark Andrews is in this new style offense. This is now back-to-back goose egg games for Mark Andrews. Now, of course, it's with the environment that this uh, team that's running the ball, running the ball, running the ball. But so far this season, you are sitting with nine targets through four weeks. You're sitting with six receptions through four weeks. He is averaging a reception and a half a game. There is no way that Mark Andrews is guaranteed a spot on your roster. There is no way that Mark Andrews is guaranteed a spot in your starting lineup. I moved him down in our rest of season rankings to tight end 15, right alongside all these waiver wire pickups. Tucker Craft is ahead of him. Kate Otten is probably going to be ahead of him now. He's right alongside Cole Komet. Isaiah Likely is right down here as well. We're looking at Isaiah Likely. Isaiah Likely is not getting saved by the fact that there's no passing volume here. Isaiah Likely, three straight weeks now, fewer than five fantasy points. So Isaiah Likely is down here at tight end 17. Now, I think maybe if you're like in an underdog best ball draft, you have a little bit of a saving grace in... Oh, okay, well, maybe, just maybe, um, when there is that game that they have to the ball a ton, we can't see a random Isaiah Likely spike week. We can't see a random Travis Kelsey spike week. But as it stands for right now, it's so damn tough to, to view them anything more as just streaming options. Now, going over to the player that I'd panic the most about, Carson Steele may not even be worth the roster spot anymore. Carson Steele fumbles the ball, then Kareem Hunt, Eats his lunch. Cremont comes in. 14 carries. Comparison to Carson Steele at two. Carson Steele gives you negative fantasy points. Carson Steele has no receiving upside. I think that you can make an argument that Carson Steele is worth just going ahead, cutting. There's no way you'd start him in week five. Week six, the Chiefs are on by. So, I I don't know. I mean, if you're still rostering Steele, you're committing to another two weeks here of... Just kind of a clogger. It looks like Kareem Hunt is the starting running back for the Chiefs. Talk about what that means in the waiver wire video that will come out tomorrow. So just make sure you are subscribed. And yeah, if you look at the updated rankings on flogfantasy.com, we have Carson Steele ranked pretty much where all the waiver wire running backs are because he's barely worth a roster spot, if that. But I really do appreciate you and really hope that we were able to help you out with this video. And of course, if you wanted to check out that Tyree Kill pick, more than less than half a total yard, For the game tonight, you can find that link in the description in the comment section to Underdog Fantasy. If you use promo code FLOCK, you're going to get that free pick, a 50% deposit bonus up to $1,000, plus you're going to be getting a free team review on FLOCKFANTASY.COM. Just make sure you set up an account on FLOCKFANTASY.COM with the same email address as your Underdog account. That way I can go ahead and hook you up with that free team review voucher the following morning. But thank you again. I really do appreciate you. Really hope you have a great day and hope you get to see you in the live stream after the game tonight.